Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Sam Cole. I'm the Traffic Safety Manager at the Colorado Department of Transportation. This is a press conference to discuss the rise in traffic deaths in Colorado last year, as well as what uh, the state of Colorado is doing, as well as our partners. Um, please mute yourselves if you haven't done so already, so we we'll get any feedback. Um, there will be a press release that's going to follow uh, this press conference. It's going to have links to data as well as additional information. There'll be a media kit in there. We'll also have um, the recording, a link to the recording of this press conference if for some reason you have to, to leave early. Um, today we have four speakers. Uh, first up will be Colonel Matthew Packard with the Colorado State Patrol. Second up will be Keith Stefanik, who is the Deputy Chief Engineer at the Colorado Department of Transportation. Next up will be Electra Bussell. Uh, she's the Director of the um, Motor Vehicle Department at the um, Department of Revenue, um, the Division of Motor Vehicles. And then last um, will be Patrick Chavez, uh, who is uh, CDOT's Statewide Traffic Incident Management Program Coordinator. Um, we're going to try to leave plenty of time at the end for your questions. Um, please do at the end, and I'll repeat this, uh, just make sure you state your name and your organization, whether you're answering a question or uh, asking a question. With that, why don't I uh, turn it over to uh, Chief Packard to get us started. Well, uh, thanks very much, Sam, and good morning to everybody. If I just uh, a quick uh, note of appreciation. Uh, you know, roadway safety, traffic safety is something that I've certainly dedicated my entire professional life to. Um, and we're in challenging times right now, and I'll get into the, the, the data that supports that and talk about what we're working on. Uh, but I just, I'll start with a sincere thank you to all of the media that's on this call to help us talk about this and spread the word. Uh, like anything else, I think the one of the keys for us to, to make sure this, this uh, issue is is prevalent in the minds of all of the people in Colorado is to talk about it. So a sincere thanks for the, the great attendance today and an appreciation for your spreading the word and, and talking about what we're uh, trying really hard collaboratively as a state uh, to address. So with that, I just, uh, I start a lot of talks within the patrol with this, um, but the only number that I'm really all that interested in is the number of people that lose their lives on Colorado's roads. Um, and uh, since 1981, uh, nobody has uttered this number in that context in Colorado. And uh, as we sit here today, the number is 745, uh, about 745. It's nearing 750 as the data continues to trickle in um, into all the places where that needs to happen. That's 750 people uh, that lost their lives. Those I've said before, these are, these are loved ones. These are friends, these are neighbors, they're family members, cousins and aunts and, and sons and daughters and uh, members of our community and uh, with a number that large and that staggering it's impossible to think of a community that hasn't been affected by one of these crashes uh, in the last year my community is is no uh, exemption to that several crashes um, in the area of the state that i live and truly throughout the state so again uh, to have media and representation from around the state to carry this torch uh, a sincere thank you this is something that we need to continue to talk about so what is the state patrol seeing um, I'll give you a little bit of specific data about the crashes that, that, that our organization is covering. And for a little bit of background, the State Patrol has primary jurisdiction on roadways that are unincorporated uh, throughout the state. So not necessarily so much in the downtowns and the urban centers that are, uh, that are within cities, but certainly have a presence elsewhere in unincorporated parts of the state. And in that context, uh, our organization has investigated 13.5% increase, uh, and 13 .5 increase in fatal crashes around the country, around the state. That's a significant increase. Again, uh, uh, moving up at a pace that we just don't wanna see. And, and, and it's again around the state. We saw a double in fatal crashes in Adams County alone. Uh, we see we, Adams County is, is near the top. We see El Paso County leading the way. Weld County continues to be high, uh, despite some recent success in driving those numbers down in years past, uh, but also Jefferson County and Boulder. And those really are the counties uh, that lead the way, uh, so to speak, uh, certainly over the last five years in the, in the state. Uh, but again, I, I, just because I didn't mention a county doesn't mean we have a problem. Uh, we have a fatal traffic crash problem across the state. Uh, and we talk a lot about the causal factors that are leading these, uh, but I'll tell you the one 
uh, that continues to boggle my mind. We can read headlines from this weekend uh, about impaired drivers causing fatal crashes. And in fact, um, the patrol alone saw a 7% increase in impaired driving caused fatalities in 2022 and compared to 2021. Oh, sorry, I kicked the camera there. But uh, we, we continue to see this increase. And while alcohol continues to be the most prevalent substance that we see abused in the context of driving safety, traffic safety, roadway safety, we're also seeing an increase in poly substance use as well. Uh, in fact, this is a pretty staggering data point that, uh, that we saw in 2022. But the Colorado State Patrol alone saw a 51, that's 51% increase um, in crashes involving cannabis. Uh, so a lot more cannabis use that's ending up in the driver's seat of a car. Uh, and despite the rumor or the, 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 the fake story that you've heard, driving impaired, whether it's by cannabis, marijuana, uh, uh, alcohol, or something else, none of it is safe. Um, and an impaired driver um, is a deadly driver. And we need to do everything we can to get those folks off the road. And I assure you the patrol will continue to focus our efforts. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that here in a second as well. But opioids also, we're seeing uh, opioids in, uh, we talk about the opioid ep epidemic across this country. Uh, we see that in driving deaths uh, as well in our state. And you can look through data sources throughout the country. Uh, for example, like uh, NIH, the National Institute of Health, we see an increase in substance use and that is, that is uh, parlaying its way into uh, the, the roadway safety categories as well. Uh, so simply put, uh, we cannot tolerate as a, as a society impaired driving. Uh, and we've done some good work over the years in, in, in talking about how dangerous impaired driving by alcohol is. Uh, and we need to echo those, those conversations in other substances as well. And again, as I've said, we, I assure you the patrol will continue to focus its efforts on removing these drivers uh, before, hopefully, before they take a life uh, somewhere in Colorado or, 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 or seriously injure folks. And just a, a quick highlight there on, on Friday, uh, this past Friday, I was able to attend the graduation of several new drug recognition experts that spent the, the previous two weeks uh, learning how to become experts in identifying substance use um, in drivers. And they'll, after their classroom, they'll go do some practicals where they'll, they'll do the studying um, in, in the field, so to speak. And then uh, they'll be deployed with several, hundreds other, several hundred others around the state with the sole intent and sole focus on, on identifying drug impaired drivers. But again, one more time, there's, there's just no excuse. I, I cannot imagine a more selfish decision, selfish decision and then to make that to drive impaired. This is not news. Uh, we, we knew this before. If you're drunk or impaired or high or on some substance, just don't get behind the wheel. There are so many safe and better options. And I'd rather talk to you with a smile on my face and a handshake to talk to you about the risks of that behavior uh, than as I'm putting handcuffs on you to, to hold you accountable for making that selfish an absolutely dangerous decision. The other thing that we saw was a significant in increase in pedestrian uh, related crashes as well, a uh, very significant, over 50 pedestrian deaths last year. And one of the interesting things is I think a lot of times we, we contribute uh, the driver behavior as to being a factor. We've actually seen an increase in pedestrians at fault in these crashes, whether it's uh, crossing the road in unlit or otherwise unsafe situations or going against the traffic signals. All of those things are there for, for your safety whether you're behind the wheel or on the soles of your shoes. I just, uh, we need everybody please to pay attention. And by the way, when you're driving the speed limit and maintaining your lane, it's easier to see and then react uh, to folks that might step out, whether it's a person or even an animal for that factor. Uh, when you're going the speed limit, your ability to react to um, unanticipated things is just a heck of a lot better. So in all these cases, we can all have, we all have a, a, a role to, do, to take uh, to keep Colorado's roadways safe. In addition to impaired driving and pedestrians, we continue to have a speed and lane continuity issue, um, certainly distracted driving and all these things, it's, they're not individual, right? They all parlay into each other. Impaired drivers tend to drive faster. They can't uh, maintain their lane. Uh, distracted drivers in the same way, are they driving too slow? All of these things are interconnected and, and the root of the cause is not giving the act of driving the privilege, the responsibility of driving, uh, the attention and focus uh, that it deserves. So. Uh, again, the patrol will do its parts. We recently did um, a public opinion survey and we heard loud and clear uh, that the most effective thing that we can do is to be visible on the roads. And that's not news to us either. That, that uh, It's a consistent theme through all of our public surveys. I read it in the letters to the editor pages in Colorado's newspapers this weekend. Uh, the message is received loud and clear. What uh, Colorado needs is for our troopers to be as visible 
as they possibly can. Uh, so we'll work on that and we'll work to be visible in those places where we know crashes are occurring. Uh, we'll continue to provide the most current and up-to-date training and equipment for our troopers to be effective in, uh, in their mission as well. But at the end of the day, again, this is something also that I've said in the past, uh, we need everybody's help. This has to be a Colorado-wide decision uh, to take back our roads and to drive this number back down uh, so that fewer people, fewer families, fewer communities lose loved ones and important, uh, important pieces to the success uh, of, of their families and their communities in this state. And so I just ask with, with one closing comment, again, that it does take all of us. And just to take this conversation uh, home with you, to have this conversation around the dinner table, have this conversation online in your chat forums or as you're in school or around the water cooler at work. Uh, the way we solve this problem is by bringing it to, to the forefront, by having it at the attention and uh, on the, on the, literally on the tips of everybody's tongues. And at 750 lives, uh, there's a lot of that's that's a lot of reasons to have this conversation. So don't wait till it's too late. Don't wait until you're talking about planning a funeral or sitting around the intensive care unit at a hospital to talk about what could have been or what we should have done. Have that conversation now and, and expect from your loved ones, your friends and family to be responsible and safe drivers. Quite literally, all of our lives are dependent upon it. Move over, keep your heads up. Two of our patrol cars struck last week, by the way, uh, and those are inattentive and too fast drivers. So please do all those things uh, so that we can all enjoy time with our loved ones in our communities. And again, thank you very much for being here. And uh, Sam, I'll happily uh, turn it over to you and wait for those questions. Sure. Thank you, Chief. And uh, also just a point of clarification for those listening in, uh, the data that the Chief was giving are um, crashes that State Patrol has responded to. Um, our next speaker, Keith Stefanik from CDOT, is going to talk about some of the more um, statewide data. Uh, uh, Mr. Stefanik, I'll turn it over to you. All right, thank you, Sam. Um, you know, just as the Chief uh, noted, I think one of the main points is it's a partnership to get this done. It's a partnership amongst agencies. It's a par partnership amongst communities, but we can't do this ourselves. Uh, we definitely, definitely need partnerships out there to really get this this uh, this rate under control and, and reduce. So I appreciate the, the great words, Chief. Um, <clears throat> so just from a, a CDOT perspective, uh, the rate of crashes per vehicle miles, miles traveled, they've steadily increased over the last decade. In, o in order for success, we need safer vehicles, seatbelt laws, safer roads, tougher drunk driving laws, education, and more. We are seeing more drivers engaging in dangerous behaviors on the road. We are seeing more speeding, careless or reckless driving, DUIs, just not, not only alcohol, but drugs as well. And thanks to cell phones, driving without even looking at the road. About 36% of the deaths are not, are not people inside the vehicle. They are pedestrians, bicyc bicyclists, motorcyclists. That's the category we define here at CDOT as vulnerable roadway users. Vulnerable roadways, roadway users. Their exposure leaves them particularly at risk of being struck. Most passenger vehicles occupants killed in, in vehicles last year were not buckled. Impaired driving is getting more complicated. Often drivers are under the influence of one or more drug, which can increase the level of their impairment greatly. Fatal crashes involving a suspected impaired driver are up by almost 60% since, since 2019. We're also seeing an increase in the number of drivers that are above the legal limit of active THC. And for every death, there are approximately five serious, serious injuries on the roadway each year. So we have a, a large quantified uh, fatality in crashes, but then we're also seeing a high increase in the number of serious injuries. Many of these injuries leave people permanently disabled and families devastated. There's also the personal financial toll such crashes, crashes takes on when it comes to caring for loved ones. So although the data points a pretty dismal picture of what is happening, I have great confidence we can reverse the trend of traffic deaths on Colorado roads. This year, CDOT is, is kicking off its Advancing Transportation Safety Program. This is a new program to CDOT. The program wraps in countless partners from federal, state, city governments, advocacy groups, law enforcement, and academic inst institutions. The goal is lofty. We're trying to change the traffic safety culture in Colorado and eventually reach zero fatalities. That's a huge goal. 
The work is divided into four buckets in the advanced, advancing transportation safety program. The first bucket is safe roads. Second is safe drivers, which, is, which addresses all the reckless behaviors that lead to the crashes. The third bucket is safe people, which focuses on the vulnerable people outside the vehicle. And then there's the fourth bucket of post-crash care. Since survival, survivability of a crash is often tied to a fast and effective emergency emergency response, we need to have a good post-crash post care program. So a little bit more detail, let's take the first bucket. So which is again, safe roads. As the deputy chief engineer here at CDOT, we realize people are prone to making mistakes. That is why we engineer roads to accommodate those mistakes. This means roundabouts instead of four-way intersections, increased use of cable rail, rumple strips to keep the vehicles on the road, improved striping, and much more. Some of the most important work is protecting pedestrians and bicyclists. Engineering improvements can go a long way in doing this. For example, we have a revitalizing Main Streets program here at CDOT, which is improving pedestrian and bicycle safety across the state. To date, CDOT has awarded $63 million in over 201 community programs under this grant. The safest mode of transportation is mass transit. That is one of the reasons why CDOT is expanding its bus tank service, thanks to federal, federal stimulus funding. Such funding is also allowing the expansion of the Front Range Rail here uh, within the state of, state of Colorado. <clears throat> Rural areas of the state tend to, tend to have a higher crash fatality rate as well. In those areas, CDOT is committing the largest investment in fixing Colorado's rural roads in CDOT's recent history. Currently, we have 34 projects completed or under construction in 55 counties. That leads to the, the second bucket. One of the most constant in every fatal crash is the driver, which, which, which brings us to the focus of safe drivers. Awareness and outreach is predominant, is paramount. If we create a, a positive safety culture on our roads, that will, go a long, that will go a long way in helping us reach our goal of zero fatalities. Just a quick statistic here, in 2023, CDOT will award over $10 million in funds from the National Highway Tra Traffic Safety Administration to local partners engaged in awareness efforts and law enforcement, law enforcement campaigns in their community. These efforts will address all of those dangerous behaviors such as havoc, such as havoc on our roads, including the top four, impaired, impaired driving, distracted driving, speed, and not buckling up. The first awareness campaign was launched, was launched last week to help curb speeding in El Paso County. Most of these campaigns target young men who tend to engage in the most risky behaviors we see on the road. The Colorado State Patrol does an amazing job contracting or removing contacting or removing drivers from the road before they crash. Without their hero heroic efforts, we would see many more crashes on our roadway. They are truly saving lives every day. Law enforcement efforts alone can't solve the problem of rising fatalities on our roadways. Drivers must also do their part. We must commit ourselves to safety. This includes buckling up, keeping our speed down, and staying off our phones and never driving impaired. Those are some just some uh, some information here from CDOT that we're really trying to um, set this this new program forward. So advancing transportation safety, we're really hoping it makes makes a change, and uh, and really shows our partnership uh, in the community. Thanks, Sam. Thank you, Keith. Our next speaker is Electra Bustle. She is the uh, director of the Division of Motor Vehicles at the Department of Revenue. Um, Ms. Bustle. I think you're still muted, Electra. Sorry, at least once a day that occurs. So I just wanna thank everyone for being here today. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to speak on behalf of Department of Revenue, Division of Motor Vehicles. I wanna echo what the chief said, you know, this is, it's not about just having this uh, press conference, it's about talking about it afterwards, making sure that we're getting and touching and engaging folks that they understand the significance of the numbers we're talking about today and how we can reverse this terrible trend. Uh, at DMV, uh, safe, safe driving strategies focus around our partnerships. And you've heard that now with the previous two speakers, you know, partnerships with the Colorado Department of Transportation, Colorado State Patrol, 
Uh, we have partnerships with MAD, the Colorado Task Force for Drunken and Impaired Driving and others. And at the end of the day, it's everyone who uses our roads that needs to be a partner in finding solutions to reversing this, trends, this trend. We have to change this trajectory. And at the end of the day, it's a shared responsibility to, the, to do the right things on our roads. Things like getting proper driver education and training, getting your license or endorsement, and understanding and following the rules of the road. Sometimes we forget that each time we get behind the wheel or get, uh, get on a motorcycle or a bicycle or a pedestrian, we do have lives of other people in our hands. And we have to remember that as we're driving and we're getting distracted and there's so many now things out there like technology and other things that distract us. We need to focus on the fact that we really are behind uh, the wheel of something that can affect not only our lives, but many, many other people's lives. So of course, our role really is at the beginning. If you start, you know, we credential drivers, we provide endorsements. We ensure that drivers are educated and informed to follow the rules of the road. Uh, we wanna make sure that drivers make good choices. It really is about making good choices. And I think the chief mentioned that in his, in his uh, speaking points as well. If a driver does violate the law, DMV uh, actually ensures that people comply with any required driver's license sanctioning in the hope that people learn from their mistakes and make better decisions in the future. But if we could avoid those mistakes at the front end, we can avoid some of the numbers we're talking about here today. We talked about impaired driving. Uh, it continues to be a big challenge in our state and the chief mentioned some significant numbers out there. So the DMV administers the ignition interlock program and Colorado is one of the states leading the country with just under 34,000 active interlocks. That talks about the kinds of stats and what we have out there in terms of uh, people getting stopped for impaired driving, whether that be via a crash or, or a traffic stop. We know that interlocks prevent thousands of impaired driving instances in Colorado by, by stopping impaired driving uh, before they get behind the wheel. In 2019, MAD reported more than 3 million impaired driving attempts have been prevented by interlock devices nationwide in the last 12 years. That's just an astronomical number. And from the division standpoint, we wanna to continue to support and enhance those kinds of strand strategies to keep drivers off the road. So it's education and it's also technology to keep, folk, to keep folks who shouldn't be behind the wheel off the road. We also know that having informed drivers and road users is the key to good choices, but it's a, it's a challenge. It's a challenge to compete with everything that distracts people in their daily lives, to, to have them really become informed, have them proactively reaching out to look at, at ways that they can educate themselves. CDOT has a wonderful website. I was just on it this morning. Great um, information for teen drivers, uh, one of our vulnerable road users. You know, how do we get the word out to say, look, we have these resources. So let's make sure you take that opportunity to look at those resources and to help make informed decisions. Uh, we also are revamping our web content to be more interactive. And today you could go online and find things about drowsy driving, distracted driving, winter, mountain, and night driving, all of which, you know, there are tidbits in there that people can look to and say, you know what, I'm, I'm about ready to get on the road. Let me take a look at some of these safety tips to help me be a safer driver out there. And so there's, there's resources on our website, there's resources on Colorado State Patrol website, there's many, many resources on CDOT website. We wanna focus on encouraging uh, drivers and other road users to use the information that we have already out there. Um, we know that a critical component of safe people and safe driving is having the right training and credentialing, whether that be in a motor vehicle, a commercial motor vehicle, or a motorcycle as well as other higher risk folks like teens, new drivers, and older drivers. The right endorsement ensures you have the foundation to safely operate your vehicle because of the knowledge gained through credentialing and in, in the endorsement process. And next month, as part of these strategies, we're gonna roll out a new service that will help Coloradoans who are concerned for a loved one's safety when driving to, uh, to be able to understand the five stages of having the conversation with a family member or other loved one and for when it's time to retire their driving privilege. So our goal is to help families be proactive about driving safety 
when they are concerned about others. So look for that next month. We also know that people learn differently. So we're doing things like releasing our driver handbook as an audiobook to reach drivers with, with an alternate learning opportunity for new drivers and seasoned drivers. Everyone knows people listening to podcasts today. So let's give safe driving information in a uh, vehicle or method where people can listen, are likely to listen, are likely to learn from it. So we're trying to follow those trends too to make sure that we're reaching out to folks so that we can have safer drivers on our road. So we're looking forward to our partnership with CDOT, uh, CSP and others to find proactive strategies to, to change this trajectory. And I believe, and I think CDOT and CSP said it, together we can make a difference. We wanna be at the table and we wanna be part of the solution to help get our roadway safer. So thank you so much for having us here today. Thank you, uh, Director Bustle. So we've, we've heard about three of the four different buckets in the Advancing Transportation Safety Plan. We've heard about safe roads, safe people, safe drivers. Now we're gonna hear about post-crash care from Patrick Chavez, who is our Traffic Incident Management um, Program Coordinator at CDOT. Mr. Chavez. All right, thank you, Sam. And thank you, Colonel Packard, for the opportunity to uh, talk about post-crash care and some of the efforts that we are working with, uh, not only within CDOT, but also with CSP and other emergency and first responder agencies across Colorado. Uh, as we continue to work towards safer roads and reduce the crashes, uh, that is obviously, obviously the goal. But we also understand that uh, when traffic accidents and incidents and crashes occur, they create unsafe situations on, for the motorists and pedestrians. Uh, they put motorists and emergency responders' lives at risk, and they cause traffic delays. When crashes occur, we are committed to improving post-crash care and reducing the response time for emergency services to respond to these crashes. We're also working to improve response times for emergency services, that, which will help to increase the survivability for people involved in the crash. Decreasing the time for emergency services to arrive on scene helps to provide timely treatment and if needed transportation to hospitals for people injured during a crash. In addition to improving response times, uh, we're working to help to get resources to the crash scenes to clear the roadway and get the traffic moving again as soon as possible. Statistically, for every minute that a crash blocks a lane, it causes four minutes of congestion. Nationwide, 25% of congestion is caused by crashes and potentially up to 40 to 60% in some urban areas, this congestion is caused by crashes. After 36 minutes of congestion due to an initial crash, there is, the, there is likely going to be a secondary crash. In many cases, the secondary crash is more serious than the initial crash. Approximately 18% of all fatalities on the roadways are due to secondary crashes. By increasing the effectiveness of post-crash care, we are actively working to decrease fatalities and congestion on the road. As we improve post-crash care, we are also contributing to the safety of emergency res responders. By making post-crash care more effective, we decrease the time that emergency services and responders are on scene and at risk. Last year, CDOT and CSP reported 48 struck by incidents that occurred on the roadway. A struck by incident is when an employee or agency vehicle is hit while working at an incident scene or work zone throughout Colorado. Additionally, na nationally, last year, 50 first responders were killed while responding to an incident on the roadway. Luckily in Colorado, we did not have any first responders killed last year, but we are still committed to making it safer for first responders to, and improving post-crash care helps with this goal. The Colorado Traffic Incident Management Program supports this effort by working directly with emergency service agencies across Colorado to improve the effectiveness of this post-crash care. We, we work to develop TIM teams across Colorado. Uh, currently, we have 27 established TIM teams of different emergency service agencies that are coming together to work to increase and improve their post-crash care. We work with these TIM teams to develop TIM plans that will help to uh, put together ex the expectation of each TIM team and helps establish what is the common response and to facilitate communication during incident response. We also work with these TIM programs to establish a common TIM program that will help them to, uh, to better understand and apply 
effective incident response measures during post-crash care. All of these efforts are there to help improve post-crash care and helps reduce the impact on the flow of traffic and the likelihood of secondary crashes. We are continually evaluating and improving how we respond to traffic incidents to keep both drivers on the roadway as well as its responders at the scene safe. Uh, as we continue to work this forward, we're, we're working to find uh, different measures and different uh, methods to improve this and to ensure that this post-crash care is as effective as possible. Uh, thank you again for the opportunity and uh, uh, thank you, Sam. Thank you, Mr. Chavez. Uh, we are now gonna open up um, to questions and answers. You're welcome just to put your question in the chat or uh, raise your hand. There's a little icon at the bottom of your screen in the middle for raising your hand. Um, but yeah, anything you wanna ask about some of our um, behavioral programs to raise awareness about the dangers of um, impaired driving, uh, not wearing seatbelts and all that, or anything you wanna ask about engineering improvements on our roadways. Um, again, we are seeing a record number of uh, pedestrian deaths out there as well as motorcycle deaths. Um, but we have a lot of proactive measures in place to address it. Uh, any questions? Yes, Mr. Steger. Good morning, Steve Steger from Nine News. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Uh, I, maybe this question is for Colonel Packard. Um, is there anything legislatively that could be done to make your job a little bit easier. I know that the legislature was looking at a distracted driving law last year that didn't pass. Uh, I know that seatbelt enforcement is still a secondary offense. Uh, is there anything legislatively that you need um, to try to improve enforcement on the roads? Yeah, uh, thanks very much for the question, Stephen. Uh, the you know we work very regularly with the governor's office and the legislature to find policy-driven solutions to help increase the uh, safety on Colorado's roads. So we will continue to do that. Uh, there are several bills that are coming that have been already introduced uh, that are aimed at traffic safety. Uh, so we will continue to engage and provide our, our expertise and feedback. So I certainly think there's work that, uh, that can be done. Uh, but honestly, at the end of the day, uh, the key to saving lives on our roads uh, is, a, is a strong dose of common sense. Uh, for people to just do things like put on a seatbelt and look through the windshield rather than look down at a at a device, uh, those are the keys I think. And but uh, the, the direct answer to your question is, uh, we will continue to work very closely with the General Assembly and the Governor's Office to find legislative and policy-driven solutions to increase safety across Colorado. Other questions. Uh, Emily. Good morning, folks. Uh, Emily Kleinfelter with Dr. Cog. Um, I was just wondering if you could, maybe I missed this. So you said that the four categories are safe roads, safe drivers, safe people, and post-crash care. Um, I was wondering yes. if you could kind of go into a little bit of what is the difference between safe drivers and safe people? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, uh, safe drivers are um, the behaviors that we see amongst drivers on our roadways that are putting people at risk. That includes speeding, um, not buckling up, puts themselves at risk, um, impaired driving and that sort of thing. Um, safe people is keeping people, um, particularly vulnerable roadway users safe. That would be um, bicyclists, um, pedestrians and so on. Um, so I think probably the best way to think about it is uh, safe people is, are those outside the vehicle, although there are some exceptions, and safe drivers are people inside the vehicle driving the vehicle. But we also know that older drivers are known as uh, our population of uh, people that we are trying to keep safe, as well as young drivers, since they tend to be inexperienced and they tend to have higher rates of fatal crashes. Great, thank you. As far as uh, folks on the phone from uh, state agencies, anything you want to add um, about the Advancing Transportation Safety Program or anything else that has been said? Okay. 
Any other questions from the media? Hi there, this is Sarah Ferguson with Fox 21 News in Colorado Springs. I had a question for uh, Colonel Packard. Um, as far as the poly substance use goes, the increase in cannabis crashes in 2022, I just wanted to make sure I had that uh, percentage right. It was a 51% increase. Is that correct? Yeah, that, you're correct. And to be specific, that is uh, crashes investigated by the Colorado State Patrol specifically. So in 2022, we saw a 51% increase in cannabis-involved crashes when compared to 2021. And were those fatal crashes or just crashes that involved cannabis? Those are all crashes, I believe. Okay, thank you so much. And I know other folks have their hands up. I just can't bring up the screen that has it. So feel free just to uh, blurt out your questions, state your name and your organization, please. Uh, this is Ron Milhorn from uh, KMTS in Glenwood Springs. Hey, Ron. Hi. Uh, for Colonel Packard, uh, is Star CSP still a, a, a useful tool for uh, concerned citizens, motorists that maybe want to get involved, report a dangerous driver? I know from personal experience, I use it uh, quite often and rarely get a response. And I'm more than happy to sign a complaint. Is it still still useful for state troopers? Yeah, Ron, I appreciate the question. And the direct answer is absolutely. Uh, one of the challenges, of course, that we have in the moment on Star CSP is just the logistics of having the trooper in the right spot when that call comes in and to get that out, whether they're you know, just patrolling in a different area or on a call for service. Uh, but we, we absolutely look at all of those reports that come in um, and, and have those within our computer systems uh, to do backtracking and, and, and those types, that type of work. But I please, I would encourage you, don't stop calling STARS CSP. And we might not be able to have a trooper make contact on every single one of those, uh, but uh, it, they, they absolutely get aired. Um, and the other thing that happens when I say air put out over the radio for our troopers, but you know, we work uh, throughout the state, we work so closely with our partner city police agencies and sheriff's departments. And a lot of times we're listening to each other's radio. So it might not even be a trooper that makes that contact. It may be a deputy or a police officer or it might tie into some other long-standing thing uh, that's going on with someone's poor driving across multiple jurisdictions. So um, it is very viable. Um, I would love to make contact with 100% of those calls. It's just not, it's just not feasible. But please, don't stop calling. And, and if you see somebody that is in imminent life safety, 911 is is always the right answer to do that. Uh, and then of course we'll, we'll get that response as well. But uh, Star CSP, Stars 277 absolutely a, a worthwhile program for, for making that phone call. So thank you for your continued phone calls there. Yeah. Hi, this is Elena Alvarez with Axios Denver. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Great, perfect. I'm not sure who's best suited to answer this question, maybe uh, Colonel Packard, but there's a bill moving through the legislature right now that would require anyone under the age of 21 to take a driver's ed course before they receive an instructional permit or license. Um, I'm curious if this is a measure that um, CSP or CDOT sees as necessary and why that might be. I know um, at least since 29, traffic deaths among drivers between 15 to 20 have been on the rise. Um, and I'm curious if you, uh, if you guys see this as, you know, the best policy uh, to address this. Thanks. Well, just so you know, um, Department of Revenue oversees that program. I didn't know if they wanted to weigh in first. Perfect. Hi, good morning. Thanks for that question. I think, you know, this is one of those situations, like the Colonel said, we'll, you know, we have seen that bill. Uh, we are working with the sponsor of that bill uh, and the governor's office. Um, we don't, we're not at a point to be able to really comment on that particular bill. Uh, but I will say in, in general, um, we look at things like driver education. I think I spoke to it uh, earlier um, as a, you know, as a component of, of driving safely. And so we'll continue to work with the legislature on, on any kind of legislation that um, looks at these items to uh, create a safer uh, roadway for our vulnerable uh, road users and things like that. I, just this particular bill, we're just not at a point to actually comment on this particular bill, but uh, I look forward to uh, working with the legislature on that uh, 
to look for way, continue to look for ways to uh, get our teen drivers, new drivers, elderly drivers, vulnerable drivers uh, safe on the roadways. Thank you. Good question, thanks. Steve, your hand is still up. Did you have a follow-up? I do, and maybe this is a question for Keith or anyone who wants to address it, but could you talk about the role of like types of vehicles and, and what they play in, in the seriousness of crashes? Like I know cars are getting heavier. Um, there's a lot more uh, like bigger screens and infotainment centers inside cars. Um, are you seeing that play out at all in this data? Thanks for the question, Steve. Uh, once again, Keith Stefanik with CDOT. I, d I don't, um, and I'll ask others from CDOT here uh, that's on here to join in if they have any specific information on that. But in general, I don't believe we're tracking it uh, specifically towards any of those trends that you've mentioned. I think it all encompasses in distracted driving, whether it's a cell phone, whether it's um, some type of um, automation that they're looking at, but in, in general, what we would like to do with our advancing transportation safety program is really focus on people to eliminate all distractions, to be focused on where they're where they're traveling, get to the point where they need to get, and then uh, take a look at their devices or uh, carry about their day. But that is the number one thing that we're seeing. It's just completely distracted driving. And Steve, I'll I'll just say that we have a graphic on the, the vehicles um, and how they're represented in traffic crashes in the state. I'll send that to you. Um, but as we know, um, the design of motor vehicles has um, come light, light years ahead in the last 10 or 20 years to save people lives with um, airbags, seatbelts and all that. But um, there are new kind of concerns with um, how much uh, electric vehicles weigh in comparison to a non-electric small vehicle on the road that, yeah, you're right, could create some, shall we say, problems with the physics on our roadway with a 6,000 pound vehicle running into a 2,000 pound vehicle. And then the other thing that we're trying to do through our distracted driving program is get people to, uh, to uh, manage that screen on their vehicle before they set that vehicle in motion so they're not constantly looking down, looking at the screen, and getting distracted. Um, Chief Packard, any any thoughts about um, vehicles that people are driving? I, the other thing I would just say, um, we tend to see um, fewer people buckling up when they drive pickup trucks. That would be uh, a mistake. Pickup trucks are more likely to, to roll over, and when you roll over without your seatbelt on, you're likely to die. Um, so I would just say that's another kind of uh, vehicle angle. Yeah, uh, Sam, I appreciate it. And Steve, I appreciate the question as well. I, you know, as far as I think one of the places that our data lacks is what the distraction was that led to a crash. And so as we're investigating crashes, we'll strive to find that. But it, um, if, if we do find it, 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 it kind of presents itself in a manner that's difficult to track the stat, if you will. So I think anecdotally, it's, it's, uh, I think we can all probably relate to this or have seen it where the, the screen in the car um, is, is contributes to distraction, whether it be for a, a second or two or longer. Uh, but the, you know, the other thing that's, it's a considerable factor in vehicles is um, weight is a part of that, but the technology that goes into that. And if you really take a step back and look at the technology that, that uh, our, our automobile manufacturers are putting into cars, it's almost to the point that you, you have to try to hurt yourself, right? I mean, with airbags, with lane departure warnings, with some of this, uh, you know, this, uh, I'll use the term like early term automation that's going in in cars. Uh, and we'll, we'll find folks that are turning stuff like that off for some reason. Uh, and and that, that, that's alarming. But uh, at the end of the day, you know, we see, we, we've seen increases in, in motorcycle fatalities that as has been mentioned already. Uh, and we'll, we'll see that driver experience going into that or perhaps a significant lack uh, of time since the last time I rode my motorcycle and I think I remember how to do that and driving too fast. Um, we see in crashes involving larger vehicles uh, that uh, I, I like the term that Sam used, the physics just doesn't work out. Um, in a little bit more brash term, we refer to it as the lug nut rule. Right? When, you'll, when the crash involves a bigger vehicle, it, it, it tends to go south for the, uh, for the smaller vehicle. But as far as the technology and the things that are going into cars today, uh, are there more distractions in the car? There certainly are. 
Uh, but I, I'm reminded of a crash that we investigated now. It's probably been four, four or five years ago uh, of a crash on Highway 550 between Ridgeway and Uray, uh, where a woman reached back and was looking for um, her water bottle that dropped um, and ended up going onto the wrong side of the road and hit another vehicle head on um, and lost a member of her family in that car. And I would just offer that distracted driving, whether it's from a computer, a phone, or a water bottle, um, these things aren't new. And just the, the key to arriving at your destination safely is to keep your eyes up, your hands on the steering wheel, and follow the rules. And uh, they're there to help keep you safe. Yeah, Lance. Oh, hi, this is uh, Lance Benzel from the Colorado Sun. Uh, Patrick Chavez at, at CDOT mentioned uh, wanting to improve emergency service response times. Uh, I guess I, I'm wondering if those are tracked in any formal way and if you have like specific benchmarks you, you're working toward or specific goals. Those are tracked uh, both within the systems with, that CDOT has as well as CSB. Um, and a lot of the local agencies, they have uh, where the call is received and then they track when the, the first responder arrives on scene. Um, nationally, uh, you tend to see the, uh, the goals or the measures put in place of uh, trying to get uh, first responders on scene within 30 minutes. Um, we don't have a, a statewide goal at this time as far as uh, a goal or a measure for tracking uh, response to them, but we do work really actively with all of the TIM programs across the state in order to help develop those measures that apply to their, to their groups. So um, we, we, we see that as a very good indicator of how, how effective the TIM team is and, and the first responders are, is how quickly are we can get the, those first responders to there. Uh, and then added to that is the communication piece. How are we uh, as, as one incident response or uh, agency arrives on scene, how are they sharing that information to the other agencies that are responding so that we can continue to uh, develop that uh, effective incident response for all of the agencies and then working together to get that uh, the incident cleared as quickly as possible. So, um, so at, at this time, like as I said, and hopefully this answers your question, we don't have a, a uh, uh, stated measure or goal, uh, but we are working to develop those within the TIM programs across the state. Does the state have some kind of average uh, in terms of emergency response? You mentioned other states try to get there within 30 minutes. Is, is there some kind of number that Colorado has? Uh, we, I don't have that uh, data right now. Uh, I could, it'd be something I can probably get for you later, but we don't have it at this time. You know, I'll, I'll just say, Lance, that in rural areas of the state, um, it's much more challenging um, to respond to those crashes and bring people to uh, level one trauma centers. So that, I would assume, you know, it all, Patrick's answer might be, it depends where you are in the state <laughs> um, as far as the access to emergency services. But that's why I generally tell people who live in rural areas of the state, you know what, you're not going to get to um, emergency care um, within a few minutes. It could be an hour. That's why it is so important to buckle up, keep your speeds down and never drive impaired. Um, so perhaps safe driving is uh, more important um, than ever um, if you live in a rural area of the state. Thank Hello, you. can you hear me? Yes, Jesus, you had a question. Uh, Okay, yes, I'm Jesus Carrasquel. I'm uh, from Univision. I just want to know if you have this information. It's really important for our community, even for the Hispanic community, that one of the, uh, I don't know, one of the uh, minors or uh, minorities in the Colorado and needs this information. Do you be able to give us this information for our Hispanic newscast today in Spanish? Because I think this strategy that you have is really important, but even important is do it in Spanish too. So I just, that's my question for today. Absolutely, yes. Um, in fact, uh, CDOT has just hired in our communications department, um, a Spanish speaking uh, PIO, so we can try to get this information 
out um, in a greater way to the Hispanic speaking community in Colorado. So just follow up with me, Jesus, via email, and we'll we'll set you up with a with an interview. And Sam, we'll make sure the patrol can be a part of that as well and provide a, a Spanish speaking Great. video as well. Great, thank you. Other questions? Anything addressing roads, uh, behaviors we're seeing, post crash care, pedestrians, motorcyclists, speed, impairment, marijuana? Steve, did you have another question? Sure. You know, I hate, being, I hate being such a question hawk. No, please and do. I, I don't. I don't know if this is anecdotal or not, but I, I seem to hear from a lot of people that they're seeing a lot more intense behaviors on the roadway. People speeding. People acting angry. Um, certainly, I'm entering my stage in life where I'm kind of doing the get off my lawn thing, but I've noticed it as well. So. I don't know if it's a Colonel Packard question, like, are you just seeing more aggressive driving and is that leading to any of this? Yeah, I can take that. And the direct answer to your question is yes, Steve, we are seeing more aggressive driving. We're seeing uh, folks taking more chances, driving at higher speeds, driving more recklessly, uh, di different types of road rage, if you will. Some of it is you know, a little bit difficult to count, but we, we are seeing much more aggressive behavior. And I certainly not a sociologist in any, by any sense of the, of the imagination, but I, I think we see this type of uh, behaviors becoming increasingly pervasive around our society um, and our roadways are far and away from immune from that. So uh, yes, is in perhaps a little bit anecdotal, but all you have to do is listen to the radio uh, as our troopers are out there working the road and you, you can hear these reports of, of aggressive, high speed, dangerous driving that's occurring around the state. Would you say, Chief, that this um, really started to ramp up during the pandemic? I know from a CDOT perspective, we saw these young men taking uh, chances, um, driving recklessly on our roadways really spike up um, during the pandemic, and it hasn't really eased back down. Yeah, I think that's fair to say, again, somewhat anecdotally, but we certainly saw, you know, in the, in the mid to late 2020, when traffic started to come back a little bit, after that initial uh, uh, suppression of traffic where folks were just driving faster. And, and one of the things that uh, I spent a lot of time talking to my counterparts across the country, uh, and we see this uh, specifically, I use the term extreme speeds, uh, where we're seeing more extreme speed uh, throughout, throughout the United States uh, and Canada for that record, where folks for whatever reason, and, and it does marry up very well with, with what happened in the pandemic and what's happened since. But, a lot of high speed, a lot of just downright dangerous and reckless behavior behind the wheel of cars. Great. Uh, Jesus, did you have another question? No, I'm sorry, I just, I don't know how to remove the hand. All right, that's okay. Uh, Emily, did you have a question? Yeah, I sure did. Um, so I wanted to touch on the safe roads part of this program and wanted to, um, I guess ask a question around speeds because you know all of this reckless driving and distracted driving that we speak of um, I think comes back down to speeds and we know that when it comes down to um, lowering speeds it's one of the easiest and, and quickest ways to um, help save lives and so um, you know you mentioned the expansion of busting and front range rail but um, what are some other methods and, and plans that are going into the safe roads part of the program um, to basically help encourage people to um, take other modes of transportation. And then when they are using, um, you know, the roadways to drive, they are um, basically, you know, designed so that they cannot be driving in these reckless and um, speedy manners. Keith, did you have anything to say about that? Yeah, what I would like to do, uh, Sam, is, is turn it over to Sam Lee, our, our traffic oh, safety uh, program manager. He's on the line here. He can he can get into a little bit of exactly what Emily's talking about. Thanks, Keith. Uh, Stan Lee with CDOT, State Traffic Engineer. Um, with regards to safer roads, we are looking at the new MUTCD that is coming out, we believe in May, and that gives us the guidelines on how we set speed limits. Uh, but we are looking at context-sensitive solutions. We have a task force assembled 
uh, within CDOT uh, on how we approach and set those speed limits. Um, in addition to that, we are improving our roadways uh, to be more robust. I think I've uh, had Steve had mentioned that vehicles are getting heavier. They are definitely getting taller. So when you see those construction projects out there, um, a lot of those are actually improving the height of the guardrails and putting in more robust crash safety systems. And that's how our, some of the first two initiatives for safer roads. And I know that cities and towns are doing great things to um, slow people down as they go through town. Um, so they don't pose as much of a danger to pedestrians. Um, making downtown areas better for bicyclists and for pedestrians uh, to keep those roadway users safe by lowering the speeds. Um, so great, um, great advancement there. Hey, hey, Sam, real quick, um, just to, I guess, to promote our advanced advancing transportation safety initiative. So at CDOT, we did hire a safety, um, a safety tier name, a safety champion. Uh, her name is Manjari Bot. She's on the line with us. I was wondering if she could just talk real quick, um, especially with Dr. Cog, um, asking some questions about how the outreach and partnership with local agencies will be incorporated into our advancing transportation safety program. Thank you, Keith. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Manjari Bot. I am your statewide safety champion. My role at CDOT is for the implementation of our strategic transportation safety plan which really looks and focuses on ways that we can reduce our fatals and serious injury crashes within our state. Um, one of the things that we really focus on is not just CDOT roads, maintained roadways, but also our local agency roadways. So um, one of the things that we are really promoting with Advancing Transportation Safety Program, which um, my team and I are have done an amazing job. I, I would say my team has done an amazing job in creating the advancing transportation safety program, identifying what those buckets are, um, areas of focus, and working really closely with our highway safety office, with Glenn Davis and Carol Gold, um, and and really coming together and identifying who our stakeholder stakeholders are. Um, in this situation, just like Keith said, we are really reaching out to our local agencies and local partnerships, um, advocacy groups, anyone and everyone that is involved in transportation and making our transportation safer. Each one of us, every single citizen is, um, is affected by our transportation, either by using a vehicle, either by a pedestrian, by a bike, a transit, busting, whatever that looks like, that is the only thing that brings our entire state together is our transportation system. So one of the things we identified when we did uh, put together the Advancing Transportation Safety Program are what are the state agencies that we need to team up with. Um, that's where we had uh, DOR, CDPHE, um, CSP. We've actually identified the Department of Education. Um, they are also our partners. Um, we are trying to partner up with ju ju the Judicial Department, um, all of the advocacy groups, um, all of the local agencies, we are having um, the we're actually be we are actually going to have for each of those emphasis areas that Sam had talked about safe roads, safe people, um, post crash care, safe driving. We're having at the end of the month a um, a workshop where we are going to identify who those important stakeholders are, who to include. What does our yearly goals look like for 2023? Identifying what those goals are and really looking at a way to bring these fatals and serious injury numbers down in our state. This is not just a CDOT um, a program. This is a statewide collaborative program where everyone is coming together and we are working together in order to bring these numbers down. Great, thank you, Manjari. And I think this is a great way to end the call with our state safety champion, Majari Bot. Um, again, I'm gonna uh, send out a press release as well as the uh, recording. Um, and Steve, once Steve has a question there, yes, I will get that to you, Steve. Um, thank you everybody for coming. If you need to um, email me uh, for some further information, just email sam.cole at state.co.us. Um, thanks everybody for coming and uh, please do follow up.